one of the most prolific recording artists of our generation, Michael Leade. Oh, excuse me, Meatloaf. Meat Meatloaf. He is a force to be reckoned with as Meatloaf exposes his raw nerve. Did you sing first or No, act I, first? I started as an actor. So you started as an actor. When, when, tell me in, about In that. high school. So you're in high school. Well, I, but I didn't know I could sing. I went and got into the concert choir to get out of study hall because I couldn't stand study hall. And I also, because there was when I was in school, there was two study hall periods during a day. And the other one, I said, I don't, I don't want to sit in this place. It's like, it's horrifying. So I went to choir. And the other one, they had this acting. They had, you know, theater class. I don't know what it was called. So I said, okay, I'm signing up for these two. And it took me a while to get in the thing to get in. And I wasn't, my, my mother was singer, Vodio Do Girls. The Vodio Girls. Yeah. They, they, um, my mother, I remember, we were, I'm from Dallas, and we were driving past Love Field, and we were stopped at a stoplight, and I'm singing along on the radio to something, and she turns down the radio, and she turns to me, and she looks at me, and she goes, God, you're not going to be a, be a singer for a living. And she was She safe. said, you can't carry a tune in a bucket. Wow. I said, okay. So I'm seven, eight years old. Oh. And, and well, my mother was the one of my life. I mean, she, I lost her early. I lost her when I was 16, 17. And uh, I can't, uh, it's, I was so, it took me 10 years to get over it. And, no. and so you know how you, you repress these things? I can't remember what she looks like, which really? is, yeah, which is really devastating. Right. I have pictures, so I look at the right, pictures. Right, right. I don't know if this is true, but somebody told me this. And I, I don't know if somebody told me or I thought it or I dreamed it or whatever. But I've heard that at her funeral, and I don't remember the funeral, I have no mm. recollection of this funeral whatsoever, that I actually pulled her out of the casket. And you have no memory of that. So tell me, where does your memory, and where does it end? Um, my memory began, the first thing I remember is when I was in high school, and it's the, it's a horrible memory for me, I was not obeying my curfew. And I was, I've been rebellious my whole life. So just that's who I was. And, I, and she took my driver's license away from me. And I, she had it and she was waving and I grabbed it. And she, she tried to pull it away and I hit her on the arm. And then she was standing at the front door and I, the screen was open. And uh, that's what I remember. That's the only memory you have of your mother. Well, I remember. It, it, what was it, her reaction to you, hit her son? Oh, I'm sure she cried. You made her cry. I'm sure she cried. Right. And you were run. And where do you run to? Because she was so sweet and so great. Car and driving away. So you had a car. Yeah, How'd 58 you get the car? Buick. She gave it to me. And she, why was she trying to ground you? Because I, I, I don't know, but I never come home on time, and I would stay out all night long and play poker. I wasn't in trouble. I'd just go play poker and win. That's how I put myself through college, too. You're poker winning? Yeah. I don't gamble anymore. Okay, so, so hold on. So, and you're 16, just 15, bur probably. 15, your adolescent yeah. independence is burgeoning. Yeah. Your hormones are. Oh, I had been burgeoning a long for, for time. For some years, yeah. you're burgeoning along. Yeah. yeah. And your mom's trying to ground you, and you. Clobber. I don't know if she called it grounding. She says, you're not driving. Right. Well, we, we would call now. Grounding. Grounding. Yeah. And by, really by accident, wouldn't you say you hit her? Or did you mean to? Oh, no. I was pretty, uh, oh, no. No, I meant to. Okay. Have you ever forgiven yourself for that? No. That's a huge moment for you. Yeah. No, never. Never mm -hmm. forgiven yourself Absolutely for not. this young couldn't Guy. possibly do that. Couldn't possibly forgive myself for that. Wow. Wow, man. Could never do that. Could never. She was, couldn't do it. She would have to, I have to see her first. You never talk about your dad. No. He tried to kill me. 
all of a sudden, kicks open. And he comes around the corner and he... My your mom, your dad, you, <laughs> yeah, you, yeah, you, yeah. you never talked about your dad. No, he tried to kill me. What do you mean? My dad, after my mom died, um, he was an alcoholic and he had stopped drinking and my mom died. He was upset obviously too. And, but he went on binges, so he was gone for days at a time. And I'm in the house with one of my best friends at, at right, not, off the, not long after the funeral, and his name was Billy Slocum. And it was just me and Billy in the house. And I'm wearing, I remember I'm wearing gym shorts, no shoes, and a t-shirt. And my dad comes stumbling through the door, screaming at me and Billy, get these whores out of this house. And I'm going, there's nobody in here. Just me and Billy. He says, you don't you get the whores out of the house. And I look at Billy and Billy goes, yeah, okay. And so he leaves and I, I yell, I don't know what I yelled at him. I yelled at him and said, you, just go, go to bed, go, you know, do anything. So I go into my room and I close the door and I, I lay down on the bed. All of a sudden, the door kicks open and he comes around the corner and he's got a butcher knife. And he comes and I roll and he plants that butcher knife right in the bed. Now, he's a big man and I'd been in little fights with him before. I'd been thrown through screens, I've been thrown through doors. Um, I mean, he's big, you know, and I would stand up to him, but it was like stupid to stand up to him. This particular day, because I was basically fighting for my life, I broke three of his ribs. You, you guys got into a punching fight? Oh, knocked down, dragged furniture, like a Western movie. It went through the hallway, through the kitchen, out into the living room, into the dining room, back into the bedroom, where I finally, was managed to, I, I hit him I, like with a football forearm shiver up to the side of the head and he knocked back over a, a chair that was shaped like this, like a, what do they call it, you know, a tube looking mm -hmm. chair. And he stumbled over it and I managed to get out of the house. And I got out of the house and I left that house. That's when I was gone, wearing a pair of gym shorts and a t-shirt and that's all I had. And where'd you go? I went to Billy's house. I walked to Billy's house and then Billy's mother kept me there. You were bruised up and bloody. Huh? Oh, I'm sure. Uh, but uh, not as bad as he was. Mm. He was apparently in pretty bad shape. Mm. I guess his nose broken and three ribs wow. cut on the head. I mean, I, but he was also kind of drunk, so that helped. I'm sure. Well, he was probably out of it. Yeah. He, he probably didn't. Did if, he he remember? Been, if he had been sober, I would. Right. He didn't remember the fight. Either. No, he doesn't. Right. He did he, not. He remember. blacked out. He has no, he yeah. has no remembrance of it. Yeah. But I forget, now see, where I didn't forgive myself, I've, I've forgiven him. It's, it, it's like I completely get it, I understand it, and he's, I have no, because he, he became, he died when he was 54 because he was younger than my mother. And he died of emphysema, and I, he was really sick, and I hadn't seen him for a long time, and somebody called and said, you know, you really need to come see your dad. So I went back to see him. And without saying he was sorry, he said he was sorry, because I had Motown, and when I walked in, wall, records, uh, you know, all the newspaper stuff, any magazine stuff, he, the whole wall was Love covered. You. Very fragile and very frail at this point. We, I took him out to Six Flags in Dallas. He was like a kid. He got on a line, had to have his picture taken. So it was fine. It was fine. And, and he said he's sorry without actually, because it's not, wasn't his nature. I, if I could give you a gift, it would be to, to, for you allow, to allow yourself, allow you to forgive yourself. Yeah, you your can mom. try. Everybody and their mothers try. I'll bet. <laughs> Were you Meatloaf then? Oh, yeah. I've been Meat since I was nine months old. Why did they name you Meatloaf? Because I was bright red as a baby, and my the dad skin, called me mean? Meat. Yeah, and he called me Meat. And I was bright red for a longer period of time than most babies, I'm told. And so I became meat in Texas. And so my cousin was pudgy, I'm meat, and it's like you got that Texas name. And it wasn't unusual. And so then about the eighth grade, I was playing football, and this is a true story, and, and I always make them up. I've made up so many stories. So bad. My favorite is uh, having a Volkswagen roll over my head. And uh, 
to get money to play a card game. And people bought into that one, really. And the other one was Raised by Wolves. I've got a hit in a pool uh, beat. And a football coach, I stepped on his foot in practice, and he screamed, get off my foot, you hunk of meatloaf, in the eighth grade. And that's when the loaf went to it. Wow. And I've been called meatloaf ever since then. Got it. It, it, it has no dignity. Oh, you have no idea I, how many times I've tried to lose. When I was 1972, when I was first doing As You Like It with Joe Papp. Yeah. I'm going, this is Shakespeare. I don't. Oh, you can't meat. be meatloaf in Shakespeare. Okay. Unless okay. you are meat. Okay, here we go. Here's Joe's. I go up yeah. to Joe. I say, Joe, listen. And I'm good friends with Joe. I say, Joe, listen, I, we got to change my name. This is Shakespeare. We need to use my real name. He looks at me, and I. this is like burned in my mind. I see it in, in, De, in the Delacorte. Do you think if Bill wasn't alive today, he wouldn't use meatloaf? Turn around and walked away. That's hysterical. We're, what, but you were playing comedic roles. Yeah. You weren't playing Romeo. No. Or Hamlet, basically alone, and it's not working? Oh, yeah, but you just, you just tr go through it. Right. But you have been where you think, oh, I was they're, doing a, they're not with me. Oh, yeah. I had a huge fight with Fred Gwynn. And he's a big man. Yeah. And Joe had to come down and kind of break us up. I was doing a play for Pap called More Than You Deserve down at the public. And uh, we had this matinee. And, it, and so Fred Gwynn just decided to walk off and leave me and this other guy on stage in the middle of the scene. So you're in the middle of a scene? In the middle of a scene. Okay. And, and Fred. And Fred, because the audience isn't laughing at the jokes and they're not doing this, he just walks off in the middle of the scene. And just leaves the obviously stage. you need him you, uh, for the yeah. scene to continue. Yeah. What did you do? We ad-limped our way out of the scene, kind of swinging the dialogue that he would have used right. onto us, right. using phrases like, if he was still here, you know. <laughs> How inventive of you. <laughs> And, and uh, so that's what we did, and we walked off, and I was fear Everybody, the cast was all standing around. I went down. So as you walked off, how, did and then other it, people were now talking I, on stage. Oh, yeah, but I wait, this was in the second act. I, wait, I didn't do anything until it was over. Did he come back out on another Yeah, scene? he came back out. He came back out. But I didn't do anything until it was over. And boy, when it was over, mm, I what was a you young do? whippersnapper back yeah. then. What did you do? I, because we were in this draft, slammed his door. I backed him into a corner screamed at him. I said, that was the most, I said, you have been working for so long and you're such a professional and, and you know, how long have I been doing theater? What, five years? How long you've been working? Since the 50s and you walk off on that guy and I just kept what, going. What did he say? He said, well, we weren't getting, the scene was going nowhere. I said, who cares? I said, so what? They weren't laughing. So what? What's the, and he goes, well, I just didn't, and Pap came down, and Pap, I got scolding from Pap for being so hostile. The old guys, like me, he said, we're dangerous in the music business. In other words, you can't count us out. You can't count us down. You can't put us in a tomb and cover us up, because we're dangerous. What you're talking about, about the drama, I didn't know about. But when I started listening to your stuff, I thought, this guy, he's a, he's a rock artist. He's a rock opera. And it's, it's coming to you. It's, it predates hair. I mean, it's, it's... Well, I was in hair. You were in hair. Yes. That's right. How I got into hair. I went, my friend Barney, who was a motorcycle guy, tattooed his name backwards on his lip. <laughs> And so Barney says, oh, the guy that I park cars with is leaving. Come down there. He was making like $230, $240 a week in tips right. from parking cars. So I went, yeah, let's go. So I went down. It was 10 o'clock in the morning. We get down there, and there's a line of people going around this Aquarius building. I go, what the heck is going on? And so all of a sudden, we're waiting for the guy, the parking lot, the guy that owns the parking lot. Right. And Barney says, you'll get the job. I'm going to tell him. He'll hire you right now. So the guy was late. All of a sudden, this other car pulls in. This guy comes out. The guy goes, Barney, how are you? His name was Greg Carlos. He was the lead in Harry. He played Burger. Oh, he played Claude. And Greg says, who's your friend? And Barney says, oh, this is Meatloaf. And he goes, Meatloaf? He goes, what do you do? I said, I sing. And he says, really? Are you good? And I went, yeah. And he said, well, how come you're not auditioning? 
I looked over and I said, That was what the line was. I said, I wouldn't stand in line for nothing. He says, well, okay, you don't have to. Come on in. Didn't know, known me for 30 seconds. He says, you walk, we go past everybody that's in this line. The theater's completely full of people. He said, takes me at the top of the aisle. He says, stand at the top of the aisle. Down in the aisle. Walks down there. Comes back. He says, as soon as this guy finishes, you're going up. Go up on stage. And the piano player looks at me and says, what'd you bring to sing? I said, I came here to get a job in the park. And so the, the parking lot said, what are you doing here? I said, and he said, well, they asked me if I could sing. He said, well, can you sing? I said, yeah. So I turned to him and I say, give me a 16 bar blues with no turnaround. And I sing a song I'd learned. It's the people that make it bad from this old 86 year old woman. I got through 16 bars of that song. His, the director's name was Armand Coulet, who became a really good friend of mine for years and years and years, who helped me out early with Bat Out of Hell early on. And um, he stopped me after 16 bars. He said, what are you doing tonight? I said, well, I'm hoping to get this job in the parking lot. He says, well, and work here. I said, doing what? He goes, in the show. That happened within a five minute period. Hair led to Motown, hair led to Pap, hair led to another James Rado play where I got an agent named Jeffrey Hunter who was, who was agent for Raul, who led all the way around to Pap, who led all the way to Jim Steinman and Bat Out of Hell. And it, the, it just keeps, con and the connections are unbelievable. Wow, and that so lady So I was like that, what was her name? What was her name that got found at Schwab's? The, uh, Lana Turner? Lana Turner. Yeah. I was found in the, yeah, in the parking but, lot. But Lana person. Turner had... Uh, yeah, you and know, I but, weighed 280, and you almost were, 90 pounds. Uh, exactly. You were protruding too, but in the yeah. different area. Tell me what you're doing on this new new record and, and how you're approaching it. Well, I mean, rock opera tells, is the way I look at it, is the way your work seems to me to be. It tells a story. I mean, things are happening. There's a progression. I mean, it's fabulous. Well, okay. I, I just wanted to progress so bad. And so I changed management. And I went to Ken Levitan out of Nashville and Irving A's off. We had this meeting. And they said to me, they brought up one name. And his name was Rob Cavallo. And I said, well, now Rob Cavallo is one of the only four real producers in the world, as far as I'm concerned. Uh, the others are make-believe. And uh, Spectre being one of them, and he's no longer. Oh, Spectre was a real producer, but he's, I mean, he's crazy. I'll tell you stories about him that will curl your hair. But Rob is a true visionary. In other words, he understands what everybody else kind of doesn't understand now, where, where music fell off and how to bring it back in a way. Where music in general, or were you? Oh, guys, like me, he said, we're dangerous. Meaning? That we have a huge audience base that you're going to go back and tap into it, plus you've got to get all. He said, we're dangerous in the mu music business. In other words, you can't count us out. You can't count us down. You can't put us in a tomb and right. cover us up because we're dangerous. Those are his words, not mine. And so I really went to him. I wanted to progress in some way. And I took in 23 songs. I thought, okay, we're, we're in heaven. They've all been thrown out but four. Wow. And the direction that he has taken us in is? I can't even explain it. I can't try. Even. A cross between classic rock in the Who Stones kind of style, modern rock, into hip hop. What a, what a joke. I got reviewed by the Dallas Morning News and invited to go down and be a walk-on in the Dallas Civic Opera of Carmen. So we get in the audience, we're sitting out in the audience, the first day they're inviting us down, and the woman to in Carmen is sitting on the front of the stage with her legs spread. And so I'm not paying attention. One of the guys goes, check that out. Check that out. Look on the stage. She's wearing no underwear in front of all these high school boys, right dead in front of us. Obviously deliberately doing Oh, absolutely deliberately. And never just sitting and just... You, you must have gotten in aria. <laughs> yeah, we certainly Her did. Her pubic aria.